This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In the 1940s, Elizabeth Short arrived in Hollywood with dreams of stardom. But at the age of 22, her life was snuffed out by a gruesome unknown killer. Nearly 50 years later, the death of the Black Dahlia remains one of the great unsolved murder cases of the century. When she was just 16, Brenda Merrill was abruptly thrust into adulthood, left alone to care for five younger brothers and sisters. But after surviving a harsh, cold winter, Brenda could only watch helplessly as the children were taken from her one by one. And from Deadwood, South Dakota, we'll bring you the bizarre tale of a ghostly alliance between a psychic in England and the restless spirit of a legendary lawman. Join me for these intriguing stories on another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. were unmistakable. She had jet black hair and a penchant for wearing black dresses and lingerie. Those who knew her best said she had a tattoo of an exotic flower on her inner thigh. Around Hollywood, she was known as the Black Dahlia, and in 1947, she became the centerpiece of one of the most celebrated murder investigations in American history. On a cool, crisp morning that January, the nude, mutilated body of 22-year-old Elizabeth Short was discovered in a weed-infested lot in the Crenshaw District of Los Angeles. What made the murder so unique was the barbaric nature of the crime. The Black Dahlia's body had been neatly severed in half, gutted, and drained of blood. You know, it looks like whoever did this scrubbed her down, cleaned her up, and then just dumped her. I mean, there's not an absolute drop of blood anywhere to be found. As you can see, the cuts on the body are incredibly clean and precise, almost as if it were done professionally. Her face had been very brutally cut um, from ear to ear in a grin like this. Her throat had been cut, and she had been mutilated uh, sexually. And basically, she was uh, the worst case of um, a sex crime in the history of Los Angeles County. It was in a quiet, peaceful neighborhood, not far from here. The body of Elizabeth Short was discovered nearly half a century ago. Ever since, the case has baffled law enforcement officials and crime buffs alike. Today, Lawrence Sherb claims to have evidence which links the killer of the Black Dahlia to another notorious murderer, Cleveland's infamous Torso Slayer. He is best remembered for having evaded one of the country's most celebrated crime fighters, a man I came to know quite well, Elliot Ness. Between 1935 and 1942, Elliot Ness served as public safety director in Cleveland, Ohio. During his tenure, the city was terrorized by a string of sadistic, unsolved murders, which Lawrence Scher believes are directly connected to the Black Dahlia case. How the life of the legendary lawman and the death of an obscure aspiring actress became intertwined is a story well worth exploring. I just didn't have room for dessert. Well, that's okay. Not now. We can have dessert someplace else. <laughs> oh, yeah. what'd you have in mind? Elizabeth Short's life was as sad as it was brief. Like so many other young women, she had been lured to Hollywood with dreams of becoming a star. But she soon discovered that fame was an elusive fantasy. With her career going nowhere and her money depleted, 
Elizabeth eventually drifted into prostitution. Can you take me home? Yes, I will. I need to ride all the way to Los Angeles. Can you take me to Los Angeles? Yes. Oh, great, thank you. You're welcome. Elizabeth Short's final days were shrouded in mystery. She seemed to be constantly on the move and was last seen leaving a diner in San Diego with a man who has never been identified. She called him Red when she spoke to him in the diner, and he did have reddish colored hair. However, the police were never able to positively identify him, although some people felt that he might have been Robert Manley. Robert Manley was a hardware salesman who had dated Elizabeth Short. Police brought him in for questioning, but cleared him of the crime. Other men who were involved with Adalia were also interrogated, but each, like Manley, had an airtight alibi. The authorities were completely stumped. Then a mysterious package was mailed to a local newspaper, a package from the killer. Boston, take a look at what I found in the mail. Here's Dolly's belongings, letter to follow. Inside the envelope, they found Elizabeth Short's address book, which was in reality her trick book. One of the pages in that book was missing. And it is undoubtedly true that upon that page was the name of the man who actually had killed her. The package was the closest anyone ever got to the Black Dahlia's killer, until Lawrence Sherb began to research the case in 1989 and connected it to the torso slayings in Cleveland. That investigation was a great unsolved case of Elliot Ness's career. In 1935, after Ness left the renowned crime-busting team, The Untouchables, he was appointed public safety director in Cleveland. Well, can you throw any light on the Kingsbury Run murders? Not at this time. That's enough questions. Have the victim's been identified? Where's the nest? They found a body here late this morning. The arms and legs have been cut off. The scene of the crime, the menace to looking. And decapitated? Yes, sir. Between 1934 and 1938, no less than 13 mutilated bodies were discovered in the Kingsbury Run District and surrounding areas of Cleveland. The victims were all prostitutes or drifters. The killer had dismembered and bisected most of the bodies with surgical precision, as would happen nine years later in the case of the Black Dahlia. Let's go. Oh, Pete, I want you and your footmen to concentrate your surveillance in Kingsbury. Right. By the end of 1938, it had been several months since the last Cleveland killing. In December, the city police chief received a letter which gave the first indication that the torso slayer had moved west. A letter from Los Angeles. And it's from the butcher, Elliot. He says he's killed a woman there. In that letter, the torso killer describes the fact that he has left Cleveland and has come to California, as he described it, sunny California, and is now performing medical experiments upon his guinea pig victims here in Los Angeles. Excuse me, can you direct me to Crenshaw and Fort? Yeah, about three blocks down, straight ahead. In the letter, the killer bragged that he had already murdered one victim and buried the head in a gully in southwest Los Angeles. The butchered body of the Black Dahlia would be found in that same area eight years later. The last Cleveland torso murder was committed in 1938. So when he describes coming to Los Angeles in late 1938, that does correspond chronologically with the fact that the torso killer had stopped killing earlier that year in Cleveland. In the letter, the killer referred to himself as a DC, a doctor of chiropractic. He said, quote, I felt bad operating on those people, but science must advance. However, the letter is just the beginning of the torso slayer Black Dahlia connection. The killer apparently had a fetish for cleanliness and cleaned the Dahlia's body very carefully with water, washed it very carefully, shampooed her hair, and scrubbed her with a bristle brush, so severely that he left bristles embedded in her skin. The Cleveland victims also indicate that there were attempts to clean bodies, uh, and he was attempting to get rid of trace evidence. A butcher knife was used to bisect the Dahlia, and a butcher knife was definitely the weapon that was used to dismember 
decapitate and bisect victims in Cleveland. Police determined that Elizabeth Short had been held captive and tortured for several hours before being killed. She had wounds on her neck, arms, and legs that indicated she had been tied with ropes. Several of the Cleveland victims had exactly the same type of marks, suggesting that they had been tortured in exactly the same manner. Also, the Dahlia's body had been arranged in a sexually suggestive position. The same was true of some of the Torso Slayer's victims. However, there was one significant difference. The Dahlia, unlike most of the Torso Slayer's victims, was not decapitated. The Torso Killer killed other victims in other places in the 40s, and he did not decapitate some of those victims either. So it is not necessarily true that the mere fact of decapitation sets all the victims of the torso killer apart. And then if he didn't decapitate the Dahlia, that means she could not possibly have been killed by the same man. All he did was simply change his MO in a rather small way. Many people believe that Elliot Ness actually knew the Slayer's identity, but never had enough evidence to prove it in court. In 1947, Elliot Ness retired from public life. He later told his biographer, Oscar Fraley, that after he developed a profile of the killer, he had been approached by a member of Cleveland's high society. And this lady, socialite, who was working with him, came to him and said, a member of one of our influential families fits your profile. So uh, Elliot said, that's fine, let's meet him. Hello. Thanks for coming. You're welcome. May I ask what this is regarding? Your officer would not tell me. Brian, would you bring the gentleman a seat, please? This man admitted that he had been yes, to medical was. school. So Elliot thought surely Have he had, had the guy. Have you ever been to Kingsbury Run after sunset? No. Ness said he gave the man two lie detector tests. Both you times, the suspect failed. Do you live in Cleveland? Yes. Ness then directly confronted the suspect and said to him, I think you are the killer. And the suspect said, well, think it. You have to prove it. Have you ever paid for the services of a prostitute? No. Soon after he took the lie detector test, the, the suspect voluntarily yeah. committed himself to a hospital. Lawrence sure believes this act was part of a complex deal the killer made to keep his family name out of the newspapers. Around that time, the torso slayings in Cleveland abruptly stopped. Ness believed that this would be the end of the case because the suspect was so deranged that he would probably remain in a mental institution for the rest of his life. But if the torso slayer was locked away in an Ohio hospital, how could the murders have continued in other parts of the Midwest and later Los Angeles? Perhaps one crucial point was overlooked when the killer entered the hospital. Darling. How are you? I'm well. Sorry I was late, sweetheart. But we can leave now. Come along. If one is voluntarily in a mental hospital, you are free to legally walk out any time you want. And I think that's exactly what he did. I think he used the mental health system most of his career. When things got tough or the investigations heated up, he simply checked himself into a mental institution, waited until they cooled down, and then checked himself out again and departed and continued killing. Elliot Ness never publicly identified the suspect and took the name with him to the grave. It bothered Ness a great deal that the Mad Butcher was able to escape punishment. Elizabeth Short was simply one of a number of victims who were slain by the same killer. He was the most prolific mass murderer in the history of the United States. And to this day, his true identity remains unknown. Next, the poignant story of a woman looking for her three youngest siblings whom she hasn't seen in years.
On a September afternoon in 1961, outside Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania, a woman named Betty Nickerson made a decision that would forever alter the lives of her six children. Just leave that stuff right there. Betty, who was twice divorced, had moved the children to a remote farmhouse, yeah. leaving her teenage daughter, Brenda Merrill, in charge. Brenda, I'm going to ride into town with the movers, so you have to take care of your brothers and sisters. Well, aren't you coming back up here tonight? Betty herself planned to live in town, where she had just bought a restaurant. But, Mom, I can't take care of the kids all by myself. Brenda, we've already discussed this. I'm not going to argue. Now, you go fix those children some dinner. She said either the kids would have to go to a home or I could quit school and take care of them. And uh, I couldn't see the kids going then, you know. So I said I would quit school. I never thought my mother would do things like that. It was a deep hurt, you know. Like, what did I do to deserve this? That day was the beginning of a frustrating, difficult year for 16-year-old Brenda Merrill. Still a child herself, Brenda was forced to take on the burden of parenthood virtually alone, to experience many of the traumas of raising young children, but also to experience some of the precious joys. Does that look nice on dress? Brenda took over her mother's role completely with all five of her siblings, Glinda, Keith, Butch, Linda and Eric. Which one? That looks really pretty. The children ranged in age from two to nine. The <laughs> oldest boy, Butch, was deaf, and none of them except Brenda had ever been to school. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. Amen. The children's mother, Betty, never once visited the farmhouse, even though her business was thriving. Occasionally, Brenda's boyfriend brought up food from Betty's restaurant. Me too. Brenda supplemented their meals with vegetables from the garden. It was just like a, a normal family, because I was like their mother, you know. It just went, you washed clothes, you, you did the dishes, you got their dinner, and you got their breakfast, and you got their supper. And, and you get them scrubbed up for bed, you know, and you sing them songs before they go to sleep, you know, like a normal household. As cold weather came on, Brenda was forced to hunt small game to feed the children. Memories of her old life began to haunt her. There was the times that you think, why can't I go out dancing, or why can't I go out bowling, you know, or, or why can't I just go out with the kids and have a good time? But, you know, after you leave school and you quit, you have no friends no more. So I didn't have no friends after that because there was nobody up there to be friends with. So the kids were my friends. You know, they were my, my life. Brenda and the children made it through the winter. And just as a damp, chilly spring arrived, their fuel ran out. In desperation, Brenda chopped the children's rubber tire swing into pieces and fed the pieces into the old wood stove. I don't know where, how I even got it, or who told me that if you put tires in with your wood, it'll burn good. You know, you get good heat. So that's what I did, and boy, did I get good heat. Brenda, there's something burning. I thought, oh, my word, you know, get the kids out. That's all I could think of is get the kids out here. It's going to blow. The second floor of the farmhouse was completely destroyed. But for Brenda, it was a blessing in disguise. I really felt relieved that I would never have to go back there again. It was a... a Great relief in my chest, you know. Mom will have to take some responsibility for these kids when I get them off the hill, you know. Reluctantly, Betty took her children in. The man Betty lived with assumed that the three youngest were Brenda's. A few weeks later, Brenda married her boyfriend. They moved to Corning, New York, 28 miles away, and took Eric with them. 
Betty immediately began to farm the other children out. Linda went to live with a family across the street. Butch was enrolled in a state school for the deaf. Glinda and Keith were kept together and sent to live with an acquaintance of Betty's. A week later, Brenda and her new husband took Eric to visit Glinda and Keith. Now be right back, sweetie. Brenda was horrified by the children's living conditions. There was just a blanket on the floor with the kids laying on the floor. And there was cockroaches crawling all over them. Oh. I got furious. Glinda Keith, get up. I'm getting you out of here. What do you think you're doing? I'm taking the kids. Like hell you are. I'm calling the cops. Because I said, that's just what I want you to do, call the cops, because I know they won't let these kids lay in this mess. Well, go on. Take them. Get out of here. I, I don't want no trouble. So that's what I did. Twenty-two, get up. Let's get I took the kids. Out of here. Brenda went straight to her mother's house. What do you want? What are Glenda and Keith doing here? I just took him out of that pigsty where you left him. It's time we started taking care of him. Brenda, take those kids right back there now. I will not. I wouldn't keep a dog in that place. Well, I can't do anything about that right now. Right now? You never took care of him. You've always been too busy catting around to take care of him. Brenda, don't talk to your mother like that. Why don't you mind your own business? Her boyfriend brought back his hand and was going to hit me for calling my mother names. And I said, you better stop and listen before you strike, because these are my mother's kids. These are not my kids. These are Betty's kids? Betty, is that true? Look, I'm taking the kids with me tonight. But you better tell Mama to do something about him tomorrow. I hated my mother for that. I hated her bad right then. I really felt like I'd like to hurt her, you know. I really wanted to hurt her because she, I felt she took a lot of my young life away. Now you two are going to mind the nice lady, aren't you? Betty notified the Child Welfare Department and had Glenda and Keith placed in foster care. Brenda thought it was only a temporary measure, but Glinda and Keith never came back. Bye-bye. The following week, Brenda was forced to turn Eric over to foster parents as well. I said, nobody's taking Eric. And she said, yes, they are. They'll have legal papers. They'll show you. You take good care of him, OK? Don't worry, honey. We'll take good care of him. Let me give you this, too. I just had that feeling, you know, a mother's instinct, let's say, that you're not going to see your child again, you know? And I never did. Two years later, the house was torn down. Eric and his foster family disappeared. That's it. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I was about 16. 30 years have passed. Brenda has been reunited with her sister Linda and her brother Butch. Their mother Betty is now 78 and in a nursing home. Me, yeah. For Brenda, Butch, and Linda, the search for their younger siblings has deep and varied meaning. Yep, Keith. Keith. Yep. It's hard to explain missing somebody and not being able to see them. It takes, when you love somebody and you lose them, it's like losing your whole life. You have nothing more to go, you know, no place to go without them. Butch Erskine also has a message for his lost sister and brothers. I love you and miss you. I do. I do. Brenda hopes that when Eric, Glinda, and Keith are found, she can finally make peace with her mother. I feel if they can forgive her, then I can forgive her. 
you know, because I'm still here and they're gone, you know. And I feel if they can forgive her, I can too. On the evening of our broadcast, Brenda Merrill's single-minded determination to bring her family back together finally began to pay off. An hour after Brenda's story aired, a man named Keith Robinson of Hornell, New York, contacted our telecenter and said that he was Brenda's long-lost brother. Brenda called me that same night, like five minutes later, and we was talking, and I mentioned about having a photograph that she had aired on the program. And I uh, basically told her, you know, detail for detail what was in the photo, so she knew that I was her brother. On December 19th, 1992, just in time for Christmas, Keith Robinson and his wife and children traveled to Montour Falls, New York for an emotional reunion with his sisters, Brenda and Linda, and his brother, Butch. He had not seen them in more than 30 years. I thought a lot about uh, what they were gonna be like, you know, if they were gonna love me for just being their brother or love me for what I am now today, if they were gonna accept my family into their heart, because, you know, it's over, th over a 30 year period of waiting and looking. It's a great Christmas present, you don't know. He is the greatest Christmas present, especially his wife and kids, too. He has a nice wife and kids. For everyone involved, the reunion was bittersweet. Their joy tempered by the knowledge that one brother was still missing. Eric Nickerson was still a toddler when his family was split apart. Just five weeks after we filmed this update, he too was found. Eric's name is now Richard Moore, and he lives in Tulsa, Oklahoma, with his wife and two children. In February of 1993, he was reunited with his sisters, Brenda and Linda, after more than 30 years of separation. Brenda Miller's long search to find all her brothers and sisters was finally over. When we return, a ghostly tale of the Wild West. Some ghost stories, no matter how unbelievable, are just too good to pass up. We next have the unusual tale of a legendary lawman, a psychic in England in a small town of South Dakota, where fact, fantasy, and history have come together to tease the imagination. It all began more than a century ago. In the late 1870s, South Dakota was booming with gold fever, attracting outlaws, gamblers, and swindlers. Mining towns dotted the landscape. Perhaps the most infamous was Deadwood. It was here that Wild Bill Hickok was shot to death, and Calamity Jane practiced her trade in a house of ill repute. It was a wild and woolly town. The miners just absolutely were raising hell in this town. Most towns are 95% solid citizens and 5% characters. And Deadwood, the reverse is true. Finally, in the summer of 1876, a call went out for a man who could bring law and order to the community. The call was answered by Seth Bullock, who had come into town from Montana a few months earlier. He became Deadwood's first sheriff. From what I have read, he uh, didn't have to use a gun, actually. The story is that one look from his very penetrating gaze was enough to quell most lawbreakers. Take your hands off me! Yeah. Yeah. All right, boys, what's going on? Sheriff Bullock took his cleanup campaign throughout the territory. One afternoon in 1887, he encountered three men whom he took at first glance to be cattle rustlers. What the hell's going on here? What are you boys doing in these parts? We're looking for a horse thief. What's your name? My name is Theodore Roosevelt, and I'm the deputy sheriff of Billings County. Who are these other fellas you got with you? Sheriff Bullock and Theodore Roosevelt went on to become the best of friends. When Roosevelt formed the Rough Riders, Seth joined up. Teddy, of course, would later be elected president, and in 1905, Seth was an honored guest at the inauguration. 
But even in Deadwood, not many people knew that when President Roosevelt died in 1919, the sheriff arranged to have this memorial called the Friendship Tower, erected just outside of town. Nine months later, Seth Bullock himself passed away and was buried at a gravesite overlooking the monument. Today, Deadwood is once again a boom town, thanks to the passage of a law legalizing low stakes gambling. The Bullock Hotel, founded by Seth in 1895, has been revitalized. And according to some, the spirit of Seth Bullock can occasionally be seen meandering through the hallways. At this point, over 30 employees and a handful of hotel guests have had experiences here, uh, to the point where it's commonplace, to the point where we laugh about it and, and just take kind of a, 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 a lot of fun in the fact that we feel that we're not alone here. Norm Stevens, a slot machine supervisor at the hotel, says that one morning he was working in the basement when a mysterious shadow fell across the wall. It was a figure of a man, but when Norm turned, the shadow vanished. A few weeks later, operations manager Joey George had his own ghostly encounter. He claims that when he walked by the bar after closing time, all of the stools were lined up in a row. Joey stepped into the office, then heard unusual noises behind him. He returned to the bar. All of the stools had been moved. But both of these mysterious incidents paled in comparison with another hotel worker's experience in 1989. We had a young employee who was, I think, about 18 at the time, and um, he was working in the back which is, is the restaurant now. And he came flying out of the back room and he was just ghost white and said that he saw a uh, figure in uh, Western attire with jeans tucked into the boots. And what he had seen scared him because he felt that it wasn't real. And uh, he was very, very much afraid and he would never go back into the kitchen by himself after that and thereafter quit. The people of Deadwood always assumed it was a ghost of Seth Bullock who was haunting the hotel. Then in April of 1991, apparent confirmation came from a most unlikely source. 5,000 miles away in Dorset, England, a man who claimed to be a psychic said he began receiving messages from beyond the grave. By pure coincidence, the psychic's name was Sandy Bullock. Occasionally, various people pop through, and the name Seth Bullock, I thought perhaps it was an ancestor that was coming through to say hello or something like that, um, and I rather dismissed it. But the spirit of Seth Bullock did not go away. Sandy claims that Seth communicated with him through a Native American guide who issued a warning to the people of Deadwood. A period of lawlessness loomed on the horizon. It happened in 1993. It could happen again in Deadwood in 1993. Beware, Deadwood. The psychic warning seemed so urgent that Sandy immediately wrote an open letter to the proprietors of the Bullock Hotel. I thought if I write to someone in this place called Deadwood, they would just think I'm a nutty old Englishman and forget it, you know, throw it away. A few weeks later, Sandy's letter arrived at the Bullock Hotel, which at the time was undergoing extensive renovations. And all information at the time as I read it, I thought to myself, well, he found a book someplace on Deadwood, read it, and wrote to me. But at the very bottom of the letter, it mentioned that Seth says he can't haunt the hotel right now because of all the banging that's going on. And I thought to myself, well, it's driving me crazy, too, so... Um, but he also said but that he'll be back and you'll know it's old Seth, quote, unquote. And that is when, again, the hair stood up on the back of my neck because that was my aunt's pet name for Seth. Anytime something strange would happen, Jerry would say, old Seth is up to his tricks again. Local journalist Rena Webb was intrigued and decided to write back to Sandy Bullock. And in this letter, I said to him, 
I am categorized, I suppose, neither as a believer or a non-believer. I will treat your story with the utmost respect. However, I have a lot of readers who will be totally skeptical about your story. Because of the skepticism, I would like to pose to you a test question. Who was the well-known person who was a close friend of Seth Bullock's? And how is Bullock's grave positioned in relation to that friendship? When I got his letter in response to my test question, he said, tall trees block the view from his old bones, but Teddy and he still meet in the afterlife. And I said, whoa. <laughs> and I still get goose pimples when I think about that. Rena believes the message referred to a stand of pine trees, which now obstructs the view of Theodore Roosevelt's monument from Seth Bullock's gravesite. It was a story that was not well known. And I, I, and there was no way Sandy Bullock sitting in Dorset, England, could have researched this. I mean, it's just not possible. There's just too much evidence of Seth's presence in this town, and particularly at the Bullock Hotel, to discount it. Perhaps uh, other people might feel differently. All I know is the evidence seems to point very strongly in the direction of Sheriff Seth Bullock still being on the job in Deadwood, South Dakota today. Now about Seth Bullock's dire prediction, we just have to wait and see. Curiously, in 1993, there are plans to raise the gambling stakes from the present $5 limit. Now, some fear this will introduce a new criminal element in Deadwood. Perhaps that is what prompted old Seth's urgent warnings. Friday, March 1st, 1991. For most of the patrons at a biker bar in central New Jersey, it seemed like the start of an ordinary weekend. Who's that? However, Gloria Brown, a friend of the owners, would soon become a key witness in a bizarre missing persons case. She was helping out behind the bar when a young woman, a stranger, drifted in at about 3.45 p.m. Can I get you something, honey? No, thanks. <clears throat> I'm sorry if you're going to sit here if you have to order something. I don't have any money. Do you want a soda? She seemed very depressed. She didn't smile. She didn't hardly speak. And very strange, very strange. Several days later, Gloria Brown saw this flyer. She was startled to realize that the sad young woman strongly resembled Dee Dee Rosenthal, who had vanished under peculiar circumstances the week before. Gloria Brown's account was the first indication that Dee Dee might still be alive. But before police could talk to the stranger in the bar, she too had disappeared. The uncertain fate of Dee Dee Rosenthal has left her family heartbroken and authorities baffled. Dee Dee's trail is obscured by conflicting clues, unexplained phone calls, and not one but two alleged sightings. Nothing about the case makes any sense. Dee Dee Rosenthal hardly seemed the type to be at the center of an unsolved mystery. 32-year-old Dee Dee Rosenthal was a highly regarded therapist who worked with autistic children. When she failed to show up at her clinic on Monday, February 25, 1991, her colleagues naturally became concerned. One of Dee Dee's co-workers notified police and met them at Dee Dee's apartment. Immediately, it was clear that something was wrong. The front door was unlocked, and the Sunday paper was still untouched. Inside, everything seemed to be in order, without signs of ransacking or a struggle. However, investigators discovered that Dee Dee was being evicted from her apartment. She apparently spent money freely and occasionally went into debt. 
The missing girl had been having some uh, financial difficulties. So it, it kind of gave rise to uh, the belief that maybe uh, it became overwhelming and she left of her own volition. Dee Dee just would not be the person just to take off. If she was going to take off or was going to go away, she would either call her mom or she would call me. Disquieting evidence hinted that Dee Dee had met with foul play. Her purse had been left behind with her keys, identification, and credit cards inside. One discovery in particular suggested that Dee Dee might have been abducted. There's a cat out here, John. Dee Dee would not have left her cat, her most loved possession. She took her cat everywhere where she went. She would never have let it, let alone alone in the apartment, but let it alone sitting out on a balcony. She would not have put it out the door and say, all right, goodbye, I'm leaving. That, that's not, that's totally out of Dee Dee's character. Police found Dee Dee's car parked in this usual spot. But oddly, her briefcase with all her client records had been left in the car. If Dee Dee were to take off on her own, why wouldn't she take her car? I knew something was horribly wrong with this scenario. The evidence of foul play was mounting. The investigation raised the distinct possibility that Dee Dee Rosenthal had been kidnapped and perhaps murdered sometime between 10 p.m. Friday and dawn Sunday. That conclusion was bolstered by an account from one of Dee Dee's neighbors the woman was awakened around 3.45 a.m. Sunday morning by strange sounds coming from Dee Dee's apartment. She heard what sounded like a scream followed by a thud, and she uh, likened it to uh, someone falling out of bed and being startled. Five hours later, at around 8.30, the same neighbor heard the balcony door open and assumed Dee Dee was at home. However, no one can be certain whether it was Dee Dee or an assailant in the apartment. But unexpected evidence that Dee Dee might still be alive surfaced a week later when the woman who resembled her wandered into the New Jersey biker hangout. If it was, in fact, Dee Dee, she was pitifully confused about her identity. I do believe it was her. I really do. She, she looked so much like the picture. If she had only smiled, I, I would have known definitely, but it looked like her. Hi. Hi. You're uh, not from around here, right? The young woman said her name was Lori and that she was trying to get to Florida. She left with one of the bikers who is not a suspect. He told police he dropped her off the next day at a liquor store near a major highway. Just one week later, Dee Dee's Aunt Celia was startled by a mysterious phone call. Mama? Who is this? Mama? Mama? Dee Dee? I'm OK. Dee Dee, is that you? Celia called me. She was very excited. Uh, she told me that she just received a phone call from someone that she swore was my sister, Dee Dee. Five weeks went by with no more news. Then Dee Dee's brother received a tip that his sister was in Florida. Approximately April 15th, I received a phone call from a, a male party who asked me if I was Blaine Rosenberg, I was her brother, which I said yes. They said, we've seen Dee Dee, or we spotted Dee Dee in the, in the Fort Lauderdale area. As I started talking, the phone disconnected. A year passed, and Dee Dee's family still had no idea whether she was dead or alive. Then on September 5th, 1992, the woman who called herself Lori returned to the biker bar. She had dyed her hair blonde and claimed to have been in Florida 
My impression was that she had had a nervous breakdown. Excuse me. Is your name Dee Dee? No, it's Lard. Well, if you are Dee Dee, you better get in touch with your mother. She's pretty upset. I believe that she just turned away from me because she didn't want to have anything to do with what I was saying because I knew, and she knew that I knew. The woman known as Lori was last seen at a Lakehurst, New Jersey tavern where she was dropped off by a patron of the bar. Once again, she disappeared before she could be interviewed by police who were skeptical that Dee Dee and Lori are one and the same person. Today, investigators still lack sufficient evidence to determine whether Dee Dee was murdered or is wandering the streets uncertain of her own identity. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to solve a mystery. Thank you.